All right. Hello and good morning, everybody, and welcome to a FAPWA's um, second gathering in the Action Circle Cycle titled The Political Compass, guided by Alex Weisenfels. Today is October 24th, 2020, and we are in the waxing phase of the moon. And during this part of the moon cycle, this is when we are um, we're refining our understanding, we're exploring possibilities. And so today we're going to kind of further our conversation into the political compass and the fundamental liabilities and really start to explore the possibilities of how this, how this can be applied to our lives and um, the conversations we, we have and the problems that we're trying to solve collaboratively. It is October. Um, which means that it's still Global Diversity Awareness Month. And even more pointedly, today is United Nations Day. So today is the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. And starting in January, they began doing a survey, a global survey, to get input from all you know, the stakeholders of the world in, about their the, uh, sustainable development goals. Um, and the pri priorities and ideas for potential solutions to address those goals. And so I just wanted to share with you all um, the link to the United Nations website that has an article about the goal of the month, which they, so every month they focus on a particular goal. And this month in October, they're focused on um, Goal 16, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. Um, so I thought that was perfectly, perfectly fitting for, for what we're doing today, today and within this cycle. <clears throat> um, my, uh, welcome again, and my name is Abigail Twyman. I'm joining you today from my home that I share with my partner, Dustin, and our dog, Ter Zeppelin, in the community of Nockety Bay. Our Alaskan oasis is located on northern Prince of Wales Island in southeast Alaska, which is located in Tlingit Ani, the land of the Tlingit people, which they also shared with the Haida and Tsimshian people. Specifically in what is the ancestral homeland of the, of the people of Tuxican or the coast, coastal tribe. I'm honored to be able to share this space with my ancestors and the ancestors of those indigenous to the land I currently inhabit who fill my soul with the fire that fuels my action. And I am dedicated to, you, um, to remembering forward and passing along their immense wisdom for the benefit of future generations and the protection of our shared home. I'm also deeply honored to be able to share this space with all the beautiful humans and change catalysts who have been inspired and empowered to join our pod. And I'm dedicated to <clears throat> using the privileged body I was born into and this platform to, um, to catalyze collective action, and I thank you for your commitment in to act, acting in the service of peace for yourself, your family, your community, and all inhabitants of Mother Earth. And with that introduction, I will pass it off to Alex um, to guide us through this gathering. Thanks, Abby. Let's see, here we are. So. Action Circle is all about learning how to have more effective conversations around challenging topics, as well as effectively collaborating with others who share our mission, or sorry, vision, mission, and values. When we come to Circle, we assume that the answers to all our questions are within the Circle because we brought the right group of people together with a collective wealth of knowledge and experience. Our guiding theory is that our respective change efforts within our personal and professional lives, as well as our movements and organizations, have had limited impact on the overall trajectory of the data. Therefore, it's incumbent upon us to adjust our approach. By bringing voices together and guiding the conversation in a new yet very old way, we have the potential to develop plans of action which are much more likely to get us to the end goal, a truly just, equal, and peaceful world the way it used to be and the way it always should have been. Our goal is to catalyze the spread of action circles across the world in the service of creating peace through collective action. Today, we are exploring further the implications of the fundamental liabilities and how they affect the way that we form political groups and, and the way that those groups understand or misunderstand each other. So we'll be delving into not only how people deal with these liabilities as groups, but also what we can do more constructively instead of what we're already doing. 
And then before we begin the conversation, it's important to establish the agreements that will guide and protect us within the circle. These six agreements are a starting point for action circles and they belong to the circle. They will be reviewed at the beginning of every circle and any member of the circle can propose additions or modifications. Number one, while every action circle will be recorded and made public, the stories shared within the circle should only be shared in a way that protects, uplifts, inspires, and empowers others. Number two, we listen for understanding, are mindful of how our words and actions impact the flow of the circle, and take responsibility for addressing any hurts we may cause. Number three, we know we won't solve these complex problems overnight and are committed to learning and unlearning so we can be more impactful with our actions. Number four, from time to time, we will pause to regather our thoughts or focus. Silent counsel can be called for by any member of the circle using the chat function. Uh, and we can say, waste, why am I still talking? Or that's Gilmo, good enough, let's move on. Number five, the chat function is reserved for contributions from those who choose typing as their preferred mode of communication and for gems or quotes harvested by scribes, any member of the circle here. Also, if also, you are always welcome to pass by just saying pass or typing pass in the chat. Uh, and number six, whenever possible, we take a pause before speaking and use sound verbal behavior, measured and deliberate speech when sharing our perspectives with the circle. So we'll make our first round of the circle to establish the agreements and check in. So we've got our introduction, land acknowledgement, acknowledge the agreements, and for the uh, the feelings question, what makes you feel useful? So, give um, a bit to think on that here. Looking around to see who looks like they're ready. All right, so I can start. Uh, my name is Alex Weisenfels. Uh, I am a I'm an eccentric existentialist philosopher and um, applied concept engineer. And I live in Madison, Wisconsin, originally settled by the Ho-Chunk people. I acknowledge the agreements and what makes me feel useful is helping people understand how to solve problems that they couldn't solve before. And I pass to Maximus. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Hi, um, my name is Maximus Peppercamp. Um, I am a verbal engineer. I, uh, I hope uh, my introduction went uh, well. Uh, I, I understand that it was probably creating quite a couple of questions in the minds of a lot of people. But as we say in the, in the meetings, you know, these things got is seen in in perspective you know we cannot accomplish everything at once so um yeah i my um i'm useful in uh, explaining things and uh, i live in chico the land uh, uh, acknowledgement is uh, that we live here in the areas of the maidu tribe and the mechopta tribe <clears throat> and um of course i agree with the six agreements and um, um yeah uh, looking forward to today's meeting. Thank you. And what makes you feel useful? 
you mean me? Mm. Oh, yeah. oh, I, f I feel useful in explaining things to people and um, I can explain things which, yeah, uh, many people struggle with uh, that, um, that are explainable and we can talk about it. So, yeah. Hi, Mary Wong. <clears throat> I am a teacher of people from all over the world who speak all different languages and need English to get on with their studies. I'm mother of two adult daughters who have taught me much about what it is like to be bicultural. Um, I am living in Madison the land of the Ho-Chunk people, but I grew up up north among the Menominee. It always seems important to say that because I don't actually know a lot of Ho-Chunk people, but I knew lots of Menominees. Um, I enthusiastically agree to the format of this organization <laughs> and I feel useful when a student says, that is so helpful, or, oh my gosh, I never thought of it that way. This, and, or, or other ex exclamations of like life-changing aha moments. Um, because I think that what I do is important, teaching people to communicate in English and teaching them to teach about what they know in English. And I feel useful when I feel that I've made that easier for someone or more possible, more easier for them, basically, more likely to happen. That is all I have to say, and I will hand it on to Abby. Thank you, Mary. Um, I am Abby Twyman, and I am a humanistic behavioral scientist, creative writer, and data-driven optimist. Um, I live on the land of the Clinket, Haida, and Simshian people, and I acknowledge and accept the agreements. And what makes me feel useful um, in my life is being able to kind of be that bridge between people who have like a technical understanding of the world and then people who are living in the real world um, and being able to kind of function as almost a, like a translator, I feel like sometimes being able to listen to and really hear and understand what's being said on both sides and then being able to kind of provide that bridge to help people communicate more effectively um and then kind of and then you know when i see like mary when i see those aha moments or i get that feedback like oh now i get that um that's that like extra bit of reinforcement that's like okay i'm on the right track i'm doing the right thing and helping to kind of you know bring bridge those gaps and bring people together so um i'll pass back to alex hmm, thanks everyone let's see and now we have like and where I just was here, here we go. Here we are. So when coming to the circle in person, or oh, we're not in person. Oh, here we are. Okay, here we go. So I'm trying to figure out which of these parts is uh, is what we need to read here. I'll skip that part. I brought a centerpiece. There we go. I need to pull it up here.
and I will share my screen. There we go. Okay, so this centerpiece is a set of balancing scales with question marks on it. Uh, question marks being weighed against each other. And the reason I chose this is because a lot of these decisions that people make are weighing unknown risks against each other. We, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we know roughly how likely things are and roughly what each possibility will cost us or how it may benefit us if it comes to pass. And this describes basically every decision that we make. And yet people often forget that and they treat their decisions as an obvious right choice and those who don't choose it are are somehow deficient of character and so it's important that we realize that this sort of decision this sort of of wager essentially is what we're talking about and we're just trying to decide what we collectively are willing to wager rather than a choice between simple right and wrong. So that is the centerpiece that I brought. And on a similar note, I also brought a song. I think I brought a song, if I can get this to work here. Hmm. Hmm. Trying to figure out how to make this work correctly. Uh, here we are. Excellent. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen with sound this time. This is a song by the band I Fight Dragons called Angels or Demons. And I won't be able to... Little by this. little, even big things change. Yeah. The way we vote is changing too, and that can have a big impact. Then. Here we go. So I won't be able to hear this, but you can hear this. I just want to make sure it's not too loud here. Angels, the demons, you pick sides, get to feeling like you know who's right, and who's gonna pay tonight. The wicked, the holy, the trick is that it's only how it looks right now, and tomorrow it could turn around. They say they found all the answers It's their way and no one can stand against them I say that I'll take my chances And then we'll see What I'll be The angels, the demons, everybody what are you the haters the hated the 
tables turn like they waited for, but all too soon. They take it out on someone new. So if you feel stuck in the center, beat down alone, well then just remember, today you're reaching, tomorrow will save you back again. Guard your friends, the angels, the demons, everybody's got their reasons. Maybe all you've seen is one side of the story. Just what I So the reason I chose that song was, I think, mostly self-explanatory. Same reason as the uh, as the scales. Just not to say that there aren't better and worse ways of doing things, but most people are very quick to judge based on only their own experiences and their own situations. And so, what I bring here today is a way to use those liabilities that we talked about last week to describe problems and how people deal with them in the different ways that, that their situations tell them are best. And so with the ability to understand other people's situations, we can more effectively collaborate to solve all of these problems rather than just pushing our own solutions. Let's see, any questions before we get into uh, applying the liabilities to the political compass? Anyone want to, to run through the liabilities really quickly? Yeah, I, I wasn't here last week, if you wouldn't oh, mind. Yeah. Right, of course, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, let me go ahead and pull those up here. Let's see. Come on, here we go. Okay, so liabilities are, uh, they are ways that we describe problems. Uh, the problems are sorted into either physical or mental being um, goal-based. And uh, there's also known and unknown. And so when you combine those categories, you get four fundamental liabilities. And the first one is, sharing screen, there we are, scarcity, which is the known physical limitations. Um, in short, it is running out of stuff, or there's a, there's a barrier that you can't get over, something like that. And then, We have the unknown or unpredictable physical liabilities. That would be disaster. It's instead of running out of stuff, it is running into stuff. You hit a wall that you didn't realize was there. Hmm, pardon me. Uh, let's see. Then we get into 
the mental or the uh, the goal based liabilities. Let's see. Here we go. Let me find that one here again. Oh, I had it in, okay. Oh, it's a different type of folder or file. That's why, here we go. Okay, no, nope, not that one. Not that one either. Okay, apparently it likes to jump screens. Ah, sorry, not sure what happened there. There we go. Day. This is the the mental or the, the goal-based, the teleological liability of stagnation. And this is a known mental barrier to your pursuit of a goal. Your, your motivation is somehow restricted from accomplishing something. And then... Okay, let's try the next one. Oh, I see, because I'm sharing this window. I'll have to convert these all to the same picture format. But in the meantime, the liability of conflict or unknown goal-based limitations where different goals are opposed to each other and you don't know which one will triumph. It could be internal, it could be external. So we've got running out of stuff or scarcity, running into stuff is disaster, people destroying ourselves is stagnation, and people destroying each other is conflict. That's an easy way to remember them. And each of them has two different two different trade-offs that people tend to make, which we can get into uh, when we discuss the um, the political compass here. Let's see. Here we go. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, what was the um, what did you want me to repeat, Matt? Uh, yeah, repeat of, I th was it like the running out of stuff, running into stuff, like those short. Oh, yes. Yeah, just, I couldn't type fast enough. But, oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the scarcity is running out of stuff. Uh, disaster is running into stuff. And then stagnation is people destroying themselves. And conflict is people destroying each other. More or less. So that's it's kind of uh, it's kind of the simplified mnemonic. And then each of them has a trade-off. So each of them can be under-regulated, where we just pay no heed. We just um, we just don't even worry about it, and we incur it, and just accept that. Uh, or there's overregulated, which is where we try so hard to avoid it that we end up running into it through a different path. So we've got uh, for scarcity, underregulated is wastefulness. We just we don't even bother uh, conserving the resources that we need in order to overcome the barriers that we know are there. Uh, versus austerity, which is overregulated, and we just hoard everything and we don't get the benefits of having it except once when we need to overcome that uh, that barrier and then disaster there is negligence underregulated which is where we just don't even bother we don't even bother with caution and we run into walls head first and versus susceptibility which is where we hide from anything that could happen we we just stay as far away from risk as possible. And so we are safe for the time being, but inevitably something is going to invade the fortress that we have built and we will be completely 
uh, unequipped in order to deal with it because we have no experience with it. And then we have for stagnation, underregulated is decadence, where people just do what they want when they want, and they end up getting addicted to things, they lose discipline and uh, self-control, willpower, whatever you want to call it. And so they're unable to do things other than what they feel like doing. So they can't work for long-term big picture interests versus overregulated stagnation leads to dogma where people limit their thinking and their imagination and their feelings in order to avoid falling into those pits. And they end up building prisons for themselves, which limit their, their ability to pursue goals in other ways. And then finally for conflict, we have the underregulated turmoil where people, people use force, coercion, and violence to, uh, to get what they want. And so it's just a free for all. Whoever wins is whoever is, um, whoever is the, the strongest, the most capable of, of coercing others to do their bidding versus overregulated is corruption. We create rules that everyone must abide by, and yet the most ruthless among us can still use those very rules as weapons and wield power over people using that structure that's meant to protect from violence. And so those represent different ways that people deal with these, uh, these liabilities. And those are the things that people, those are the things that people identify with without really deliberately doing so. They, I should start over. Different people in different situations are willing to make different trade-offs about these liabilities. So for instance, a person may want to person may want to be more austere with their money and spend a lot of time saving money, or they might be the reverse. They might spend as much as they have to in terms of money in order to save time. It's just a matter of what do they think they are most prepared to deal with? What is the trade-off that they're willing to make? But then society has to collectively make trade-offs because a lot of our trade-offs affect other people. And so we have to decide as a group, our projects are going to make one trade-off or another. And what are we willing to do? And that's where political parties form because people are willing to make different trade-offs. They respond differently to these liabilities based on what they think they can survive. So this is where we talk about how that works. And I will share the political compass. There we go. So this is the, the political compass as I, um, I believe I took the political compass test in high school or thereabouts. So that's where I first saw this. Um, anyone, has anyone not seen this sort of diagram before? Oh, okay. So this, this may be the first time that you've seen this then. Um, this is how many people attempt to categorize different political leanings, two dimensional, a uh, graph that has two different axes on it. So the horizontal axis, what, uh, what I've been doing is I've been calling the, the economic left uh, progressives and economic right conservatives because that's often what they call themselves. I just couldn't find a diagram that had those labels. And then uh, the bottom, uh, ac the bottom direction here, the vector point down, that's libertarian. And then the top one is authoritarian here. And so each of these cardinal directions makes different trade-offs for these liabilities. Alex. And do you have a question, Maximus? Can you, can you show the picture in the, uh, so that I can see the full picture? I cannot really see the whole picture. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that it wasn't all showing up. 
Oh yeah, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you're very welcome. Uh, let's see, so is is it fully visible now? It's a little bit more visible, but not fully. I can mm -hmm. see it completely. Is it? Do you need to scroll or something, Maximus? Oh, oh, maybe it might be a screen maybe, resolution maybe. thing. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, because I can see. Yeah, it. I don't have any trouble. Out? Maybe a it's, if I'm showing the whole screen. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got oh, it. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you for this. Oh, yeah. No problem. Let's see. So, at this point, let's go back to my notes here because they have the most comprehensive, uh, comprehensive summary of this here. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Now, so the progressive approach on the left hand side is to reject the status quo and want to change it through policy because what progressives think is that what they change the status quo into will be better. If not for everyone, then at least for the people who are, who are most deserving, who, who we care most about helping. Progressives see the flaws in the status quo and they feel that the choice to make it better is obvious. They fear austerity and susceptibility more than they fear wastefulness and negligence. So what that means is the, the progressive approach is to use more resources and to, to take more risks. So that's, that's the trade-off they make when dealing with scarcity and disaster. So it's, it's a preference for let's change this, let's put more effort, more resources into changing this and it, things might not work right, but it's very important that they not stay the same because right now the status quo is unacceptable. And so what they value is, of course, progress, improvement, and innovation, things like that. And then on the other side, on the right-hand side, the conservative approach is to accept the status quo because they fear that change will make something worse. Part of the reason they feel this way is because they tend to work with high stakes physical systems like agriculture and heavy machinery and any change they make could have dire consequences. They feel that if a person has a problem with the status quo, then it's their responsibility to deal with it. So what they fear is wastefulness and negligence more than they fear austerity and susceptibility. So if something, if something is a, a problem about the status quo, if the status quo is unhealthy in some way, they're willing to accept that more than the risk of trying to change it and cause maybe another problem. And so they value things like caution and certainty. And conversely, the, um, going back to the progressives, a lot of progressives tend to work with things that are either creative or research-based. So they deal with new ideas, new knowledge. Um, so if they aren't somehow changing something, then they, they don't have a career. So that tends to, to lead into their approach, either because they chose it because that's their approach or their career influences their approach after they choose it either way. So both of these are just different trade-offs that people take to scarcity and disaster, the physical liabilities. And both of them have their pros and cons, um, no pun intended. And then any questions on that so far? with uh, the physical liabilities and the, the horizontal axis there. Yeah. So it makes sense for, for everyone so far. Mm, excellent. Now we get into the, the vertical axis and the motivational or the goal-based liabilities. So at the bottom we have the, uh, the libertarian direction, libertarian approach which is 
to allow individuals to do what they judge best for them. They feel that rules take away people's rights to live how they want uh, and make it easy for those who enforce the rules to oppress others and often to restrict people from using their own judgment to deal appropriately with the situation they're familiar with. So libertarians fear dogma and corruption more than they fear decadence and turmoil. So they value freedom and liberty, of course. And then on the other hand, we have the authoritarian approach, which is to impose rules that ensure that activities of individuals don't harm society as a whole. Authoritarians feel that without being held accountable to rules, people will develop selfish and short-sighted habits that lead to big picture and long-term problems. So in order to, to protect the system, they build these structures and authoritarians fear decadence and turmoil more than they fear dogma and corruption. And so authoritarians value coordination, cooperation, um, accountability, and solidarity, things like that. Any questions on the vertical axis? Can you repeat what you just said? They, they value coordination and what? Oh, yeah. Coordination, uh, cooperation, accountability, solidarity. They, they like creating structures to protect systems. And so all of these, oh, sorry, Abby, did you have a question? Or? Oh, okay. Nope, just not. Uh, okay. So, although these appear very, very fundamental on the political level, like very, uh, very monolithic, these are actually just describing the different trade offs that we make all the time. Like, people may be more authoritarian towards their children than towards their peers. Uh, people might be more conservative towards a, a scarce resource. They, they make trade-offs based on what they feel they can more easily, hmm, how do I put this? I think I said before, somebody might, um, might trade time for money or back again. So it really all depends on what trade-off you feel you can afford to make with, with a particular situation and the particular resources that you have at hand. And so I have an exercise here so that we can just make sure that, uh, that we understand this. Um, oh, I do, oh, that's, I'll save that for my example here. Uh, let's see, so the exercise that I've got is to just pick a, a policy that you either passionately support or passionately oppose and just think about what sort of underregulated or overregulated liabilities may lead to your feelings about it. And then pretend you feel the opposite way about the policy and what sort of underregulated or overregulated liabilities do you feel might uh, might harm you or those you care about, which would lead to those feelings. So you don't have to reveal what your actual opinion is, but you can just say, looking at it from both sides, what sorts of of liabilities, underregulated or overregulated, what what sort of trade-offs would lead people to take either position on a contentious policy. And we can take maybe uh, five minutes or so to, uh, to think about that. Okay. Oh, and Mary, you're not muted. Did you have a question? No. Oh, okay.
Oh, sorry, Max, did you have a question? N no, I'm I'm ready. Oh, okay. Let's see. So, hang on. So we're going to take uh, another couple of minutes here. We're still thinking. Ready now. Uh, excellent. Looks like uh, we're all set. So the example that I found, and so before I go into the example, I should note, um, probably should have noted this earlier, but this, um, as implied by the, the two-dimensional nature of the political compass, it is entirely possible to combine these terms to have, uh, for instance, authoritarian progressive, authoritarian conservative, libertarian progressive, libertarian conservative. It all depends on what kind of liability you're dealing with and what sorts of trade-offs you're willing to make. So this isn't supposed to be boxes to put people in, but rather a vocabulary to describe what a person is doing in any given situation. So it will change based on the perspective and based on the situation. And the example that I have illustrates that I think rather well. Um, sorry if, I, if I'm taking the example that you thought of here. Um, so let's see. Under regulation and over regulation can depend on perspective. For instance, a person may favor spending large amounts of money to protect the environment because they fear that the environment is being wasted, while another person may feel that the environment is in less danger than the economy, and therefore it is the money that is being wasted compared to things it could otherwise be spent on. So what counts as waste depends on what you think is more valuable or more scarce and what resource you're counting. So you could say that the um, a person might be economically conservative and the person who is favoring the, the environmental policies would be economically progressive. Or if you, if you used a, an alternate political compass that looked at nature as the resource and money as just some, some, external, um, some external medium of exchange, some, some other factor, you could say somebody is naturally, you know, environmentally conservative versus environmentally progressive, uh, describing how much they are willing to, to alter the face of the earth in order to become more prosperous, something like that. So I hope that illustrates how the words can be used to describe things from different perspectives, and it's not simply from the perspective of only money, it's, it's any resource. And with that, uh, so that's the, the example that I thought of there to understand both sides of uh, environmental policy. And uh, with that, I pass to Maximus. Okay, well, I was immediately thinking of COVID-19 and how we are dealing with this, uh, yeah, on the local level and on the state level and on the national level. And yeah, how that results in all sorts of conversation and um, decision-making processes, which, um, yeah, which are uh, determined by, of course, also the outcome of the testing that is being done. And um, so, um, but then again, um, yeah, there is, there is, there is um, some people, you know, I can hear the area where I live, 
some people are advocating for opening the schools and other people they don't want the schools to the school board is still saying no we got to keep it closed and so yeah you get this um, heated discussion there and um, um, the state uh, uh, governor uh, Newsom um, has um, our area is is in in a certain level of risk that um, um, that is considered to be ready for opening up again you know but it's still yeah you know it's still uh, locally determined by uh, yeah different schools and then here in the area there's the various towns where they have opened certain schools and then there was an outbreak again so so then you then then everybody's got to go back to square one again and so it's a really difficult uh, situation because yeah you cannot overregulate it i mean it is it's really on a case case by case but what is case by case you know and and so um but yeah uh, uh, from from the more uh, uh, republican perspective uh, they want the, the schools to be open and they're strongly advocating for that and it seems for more the um the left, uh, uh, the democratic perspective, it is more like no, they want to be more safe than sorry, and 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 turn back the clock again. So yeah, that's that's where it's at at this moment, and it's really, it's really difficult because yeah, of course there's also testing currently. There's more people testing positive again. Um, it's it's a really difficult issue, you know, and and I think a lot of people are also not prepared to sort of just really think it through uh, all the implications and um and then and then of course there's the main public who who when they hear that uh, that uh, the the rules are uh yeah that uh, that the places are opening up again then they all want to go and sit in cafes and they want to go and have parties you know i mean and i can't i, I cannot blame anybody i mean because everybody is just sick and tired of sitting at home you know but uh yeah, so it's it's a big dilemma, and um, and so yeah, we are. We, you know, you were mentioning disaster. Well, um, yeah, how long is this going to last? You know, and uh, what are the prognoses? And uh, and what do we value then? Also, in terms of because people are going out of business, uh, businesses are clothing folding up left and right, and what what will the world look like when this when when we just keep closing things down you know and and what what are the risks of getting it uh, weighed against uh, uh yeah you know just having economical activity and also children going back to school again uh, all the mental health issues involved to staying at home not being at school not being not doing any sports uh, oh my goodness it just goes on and on i know it sounds kind of dismal but uh, that's the situation we're in you know yeah Maybe you can give me some help with it, thinking this through in terms of, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, what we can do to, I, I mean, of course, we need to just, you know, I, I listened to some Facebook uh, uh, sites where the people here in the, in the city of uh, the local board of uh, the schools were talking with each mm -hmm. other. And it, I could, um, yeah. So I'm going to, to call, um, well, not exactly Gilmo, but the, I'd like to, to try framing that excellent description of the situation in terms of the uh, the liabilities and trade-offs, because it, it sounds like we are dealing with physical liabilities here, scarcity and disaster. Um, disaster is obviously the the more um, the more well publicized, but uh, it, it seems like we're actually dealing with kind of a trade-off between the the potential disaster of people being semi-predictably um, infected with uh, with COVID-19 and with semi-predictable uh, health consequences as a result of that versus the, um, the known economic costs which would fall under scarcity. So it seems like we're, um, I should probably emphasize a lot of these uh, Liabilities can interact with each other to to either kind of cancel each other out or to aggravate each other and amplify. And so trade-offs can do similar things. So trade-offs can interact with each other. So it sounds like 
there might be people who are who are favoring austerity uh economically to to um maintain our, our resources but not actually use them because they fear negligence it's hmm. I would have to choose a perspective to describe. So I would say people who are being health conservative, which is to say they're they're being conservative about health issues, they would rather use austerity and susceptibility and just keep everything shut down until we can figure out how to somehow eliminate the the virus or until it just dies out without having any any carriers uh, versus the people who are more health progressive want to to um, apply what we have to to use the the health that we have now to try and and move other things forward something like that and of course I can see why why either side would appeal to people I can definitely see the uh, the the attractive and the frightening aspects of either does does that make sense as a description of the situation yeah yeah thank you very much for this elaboration and uh, that makes it very clear in terms of these liabilities and stuff like that and uh, and also how these liabilities interact as well yeah uh, excellent no Mary, did you have an example? I did. I purposely avoided COVID because I thought it's really complicated and I'd maybe like to sit down for an hour and sort of map it myself because I do feel like I can be really dismissive of views that are, I'm thinking of a cartoon I shared early in the, um, pandemic on Facebook where there's the dinosaurs running from the meteor and one is turning to the other and saying, oh no, the economy. Um, and I think like from, I'm, I'm a person who's going to be dismissive of the economy, but then I'm not, you know, I'm not a small business owner. So I'm protecting what I have, which is my health. Um, but if I had a business that I'd spent my life building up, I might feel more strongly about protecting the economy. Anyway, I went with something much closer to home, which is um, the University of Wisconsin's ESL requirement for um, students who have not been educated in English or who graduate from high schools in countries where um, education is not traditionally carried out in English. And this is already a modified policy because we used to test all the Indians and now we're not allowed to do that anymore and they all get the, the test that native speakers take to the detriment of some and I'm sure to the advantage of others. Um, so the policy is ESL testing, um, ESL English language fluency is a requirement for all graduates of the university and um, the, the policies around um, demonstrating fluency in English are more rigorous for international students than they are for non-international students. And so I was thinking, well, you know, of course, this is my profession. I'm going to protect the importance of that. Um, so I have to recognize that there's that. Um, Okay, I'm just gonna go through my list because otherwise I'll get confused. So there are parents in particular and their kids also who feel that they should be trusted to make the decision whether or not their child needs additional language support to do well in their studies. They feel like it's a waste of time and money you know, they have to pay for those three credits or those six credits that their kid takes so that they learn to read academic texts more quickly and um, more effectively, that they have to pay for those three credits where their kid learns to write 
um, compose an argument, uh, recognize a counter argument and refute it. Um, and they feel it's a discriminatory policy because they say that, um, you know, the American students don't have to do those things. So <clears throat> what I started to realize is that like, I was looking particularly at wastefulness because both sides are concerned about waste. The parents of the international students are worried about wasting money, wasting valuable time. The ESL professionals like myself recognize that students who don't get help early on fossilize. The age of, there's a huge difference between trying to learn English at, or a foreign language, any foreign language, at 18 and at 22. Because there's still some of that residual adolescent flexibility at 18 and by 22, a lot of that has been lost. By 25, when we get them as graduate students, even more and someone in their 30s or 40s is very unlikely to improve in a language that they've been speaking for any length of time because of fossilization. So we're, uh, we're worried about wasting this opportunity. Here's your chance. You just got to the university. Here's when you can get better. If you don't do it now, if you don't get this instruction, and the research bears this out, <laughs> you probably won't ever get better or get very much better at language, although some people do. Um, the parents believe that their child will improve just by being in the environment. So I, I would call that negligence. They think the costs are too high and that they're not getting anything they wouldn't otherwise get from the, from the point of view of um my team <laughs> that's their that susceptibility is it yeah they're just we know what the what can be expected as a bad outcome of this but you're going to go ahead and do that anyway because of a short-term savings or what seems like a short-term savings um I think that our the policy that ESL is required would be seen as dogmatic I think I feel that there should be a rule in place because without the rule, more people would be harmed rather than fewer. Whereas I think that it's pretty obvious that that, that dogmatic nature is, is seen as overly restrictive by parents who think their kids should just get on with their education Whereas we're saying you can't get on with your education without the proper tools. And one of those tools is going to be being as good at English as your native classmates or close to that and having strategies to work around that. Um, I think that uh, we're definitely seen as being kind of corrupt in, in, in clinging to this requirement because they're like, well, of course you think this is important because you're an ESL teacher. You're not gonna have a job if you don't do this. Um, whereas we see those who are insisting and people have sued the university over this. And so the university is starting to capitulate and people in my field are like, that's so wrong. That's so immoral. That's just, why would you do that? But for the university, it's like, ah, oh, do, we, do we bother with this? So we see these lawsuits as creating turmoil and creating a situation in which the, the weakest, the most vulnerable members of the university community are at risk. Lots of them are at risk because of the, act, the libertarian actions of a few. Um, whereas I'm, sh like I said, they think we're corrupt because we're clinging to that. Did I, is this what we were trying to do? We were trying to like sort of look at it in these terms. I felt like I was thinking it more clearly when I was writing it than now when I'm trying to say it. So, so it's, that's pretty much what it was supposed to do. And the, to the extent that the vocabulary is difficult to apply, like difficult to see, okay, how does it fit in these terms? You don't really have to use it for that purpose. 
it some situations are rather nuanced so it takes um it it takes a bit of uh looking at it from different angles to figure out how to use a particular word but the most important thing is to be able to see the different trade-offs that people are are willing to make based on what they think they can afford um so one thing that you pointed out that I think is really salient for me is the reliance on research. And I hadn't thought about this in this, I mean, I had thought about it. I'm like, oh, there's all this research and they just don't care. You know, they haven't looked at the research. They haven't, they haven't asked somebody who's an expert. They just assume that they know which is a really libertarian thing. Like, this doesn't feel right to me. Whereas I'm like, guys, there's just so much research that supports that early ESL interventions make an enormous difference in success in academia. Um, look at the research, but of course they're not looking at the research. They're looking at, oh my God, that's going to be $8,000, you know, by the time I'm all done paying for those credits and you might have to take an extra semester because you're taking these extra English electives and, you know, they're looking, they're, they're feeling it and I'm looking at the research. And yet the assumption on that side is, well, you're, you're looking at the, you're not looking at the research, you're looking at your paycheck. So I think there is this like attribution to people who take the opposing view that, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the idea of like the research thing, I'm obsessed with research. And so I'm always going to float authoritarian left, I think. Um, and I should know that about myself. That's a thing that I should know going into any discussion. Maybe other people just don't care that much about the research. I, maybe I have to look at other angles. I'm done talking. I'll mute myself. <laughs> okay. Abby, do you have an example? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, so the example that I thought about um, was in relation to um, drug policy. So the policies related to criminalization of drugs, um, application and research of use of certain drugs in treatment of mental health issues, and then also policies related to safe use sites. Um, so can, when thinking about my own, um, my own like perspective on the, on this policy, I, I thought that I, you know, I could, would kind of conceptualize my perspectives as more like progressive libertarian. Um, so, you know, the status quo right now is, you know, still primarily like criminalization, drugs are bad, you know, everything is schedule one, and we don't really look at potential positive use of certain drugs like cannabis and psilocybin and MDMA and things like that. Um, but there's research that is showing really positive impacts, especially in application to people with, um, you know, really deep depression and um, PTSD that hasn't been able to be treated effectively with other, um, other modalities. Um, and then kind of on the, so that's more on the pro progressive side of my thoughts and beliefs about it. And then on the um, kind of libertarian is kind of allowing people, you know, my perspective is that we should allow people to make choices for themselves and judge what's good for them. Um, and, but then kind of thinking about the other side of the argument and the trade-offs that, um, kind of on the more conservative authoritarian perspective on the issue, I just, I started to think about, okay, if I was that person, what are the things that are driving my beliefs about decriminalization? So, you know, basically saying like, thing, it need, all drugs need to be criminalized. We can't use safe use, use sites. Um, we can't apply this to mental health issues. Everything is restricted. We can't do research. Um, and 
um, I was thinking more, thinking along the lines of like the fear, like being, you know, if me like fearing that drugs are going to be, if we open things up, they're going to be misused. There's going to be more addiction issues. Um, and kind of that perspective coming potentially from their history of not seeing a positive impact. So not having a positive, you know, maybe they've, used certain drugs themselves and not had a positive impact or they've seen other people in their family and their lives use drugs and and seen them be negatively impacted so then if that fear of the negative and those strongly held beliefs about drugs and drug culture and kind of like what what that means and what it looks like is more kind of driving their thinking and perspective on the issue and not wanting to change anything. Like we're not going to make any changes because if we do, then, you know, all hell's going to break loose and we're just going to have, you know, world full of drug addicts. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of, I, that's, that's, those are the kind of the terms from this framework that seem to kind of make makes sense to me about how to how to look at both sides of the issue and um think about how you know how those different perspectives might influence our influence our arguments for or against it hmm, awesome thanks so much everyone for, for all those examples those those are exactly the kinds of problems that these vocabulary concepts are created to help us understand because we have our own position on it based on how these liabilities affect us and those we care about and then other people are affected differently and so we have to understand how they're affected if we want to create a constructive approach. And that is the next thing that we're going to get to here because it's not all about trade-offs where you have to have something bad happen. There are constructive approaches that go beyond trade-offs, go beyond accepting that something bad is going to happen and you just have to choose what. And so, here, we're going to talk about the virtues to counteract the liabilities. So people have different views on different policies, as we discussed, not necessarily because they're selfish, but because they think that society will be able to survive one set of liabilities more than the opposite set, and one set of trade-offs in a particular context. Because, or sorry, based on what we know of people from how we grew up, we all want to protect people from different kinds of harm. We just prioritize what we protect people from in different ways. And then the real problem comes when we start to throw away the opportunity to build mutual trust, when we latch on to a particular method of solving the problems that we most fear. And when other people say that the solution that we chose incurs the things that they fear, we say they're just evil, that ours is the only way. We don't work with them to come up with something better that will put to rest all of our fears. And there is something better. Each liability has a virtue that deals with it constructively. And it is more difficult, but it is more rewarding than simply under-regulating it or over-regulating it. And so I'll pull up, oh, and I forgot to, I forgot to show the pictures for the, uh, for the positions, oh well. Those are in the article anyway. Um, here we go. Aha, here is the first picture. These are not in the article. Here we go. What article are we talking about? Oh yes, yeah, sorry. So this this workshop is actually based on an article that I wrote, and I was um, I was expressing regret that I had these pictures representing like the progressive, conservative, uh, libertarian, authoritarian positions, but uh, those are in the article anyway, so they'll they'll get their day in the limelight there. Um, we're, let's see. 
based on the, the time budget here, it is time to talk about investment. Investment is the virtue that counteracts scarcity. It is not wastefulness and it's also not austerity because we do spend resources, but we spend them in order that we may get more back so that we will increase our overall prosperity based on based on skillfully applying them. And it is difficult. I say investment as though it's just some sort of magic word. It's not. It takes skill. It takes all sorts of, of calibrated mindsets and attributes, but it is the approach that will overcome scarcity to be able to invest things, to spend now to get back more later rather than just spending everything with no expectation of return or hoarding things where it, they don't do any good. And then, let's see, I'm going to see if I can navigate to the next picture. There we are. To counteract disaster, we have preparation. And preparation I had originally called this exposure, but my cohort pointed out that preparation encompasses a lot more of the of the uh, nuance and the positive skills and the scope of this. Preparing for disaster can mean any number of things depending on the situation. It could mean uh, actual exposure and going out and and being relatively cautious in a controlled setting, experiencing just a, a miniature version of a disaster. Just um, instead of running head first into a wall, you sort of feel your way through and you run into the wall and depending on how fast you're going, it may hurt, but less than if you were going at full speed. So creating some sort of a controlled setting where the disaster can happen without causing too much damage, and now you know about it and you know what to do about it. That's, that's one option. However, you don't necessarily need to know that the disaster is even possible. All you need to know is how does the system work that I rely on? What are the different parts of it? And if any of those parts were to disappear, what would happen? And how would I deal with that? So you don't need to know how it disappears or what causes it to disappear. You just need to have a contingency plan that will allow it to, uh, to work if that part vanishes, something like that. So preparation involves just going out and getting experience, but also practicing what to do if something unexpected happens and something that you were relying on uh, is is removed. So that's preparation and you can prepare with you can prepare with having physical resources or you can prepare with uh, practicing the skills of what you would do. There's that. Then let's see where I have this here. I have it somewhere. There it is. Um, this was kind of the best picture I could find for this. It's kind of an abstract concept. To deal with stagnation, transcendence, it literally just means going beyond. But uh, I'd say in order to avoid both decadence and dogma, transcendence requires us to develop mm, discipline, understanding, uh, anything that would allow us to deliberately resist doing things just because we want to in the short term, while at the same time being able to think of things without necessarily accepting them as true. But, uh, that standard quote, uh, an educated mind is one that is capable of entertaining an idea without accepting it. That's very important to transcend dogma and to transcend decadence, we can apply discipline so that we 
can deny ourselves the immediate pleasures in order to do things that are in our long-term interests. So I just file all of that under transcendence. And it is also difficult. Preparation is difficult. Investment is difficult. Transcendence is difficult. Not just difficult to practice, but also difficult to know how best to do it. But again, it is, it's the direction that we can go in to escape these, uh, these trade-off traps. And then we have, in order to deal with conflict, ethics. In order to, to avoid both turmoil and corruption, we need to use ethics to take into account what we all want and how we can do what works for society while at the same time not trampling over each other as individuals. And we can stand up for the principles that we decide will protect all of us, even when they don't concern our own individual interests, or even when it might be it might be more difficult for society as a whole, but we can all agree to to put in a bit of extra effort to make sure that people can do what they what they have the right to do, that they aren't oppressed by force or by rules. And so that way, even without restrictive rules and even without the threat of force, we can get what we want by working with each other to to mutually cooperate and to apply all of the other uh, all the other virtues so that's my most generic explanation of how ethics work because i know everyone has a different picture of what is most ethical and so it's yeah, it is high time that we get to the uh, the last exercise here for today. Here we go. Yeah. Here we are. Um, regarding the policy that you picked for exercise three, or perhaps another policy that you think works better for this exercise, brainstorm a few approaches that can avoid those bad trade-offs that you see. Um, and the bad trade-offs that you saw when you were pretending to take the, uh, the opposite viewpoint and see if you can find some sort of uh, a creative approach that might, it might take a bit of extra effort. It might do something that appears outside the scope of the immediate problem, but something that might go a ways towards, uh, towards benefiting everyone involved while putting everyone's fears to rest. So we can take uh, five minutes to do that here. And then after that, we'll have 20 minutes. So want to, mm -hmm. I want to probably go through the explanations in a decent clip, not too fast though. Can you put the, the mm -hmm. in the chat? Um, put the, oh, the description of the exercise? Yeah. Oh, of course.
Do we want a few more minutes? I'm good. Looks like we're good to go. Next one. Let's see. Oh, I actually realized that I hadn't thought of an example for myself, so I had to, to use those minutes to come up with something here. Um, so this, uh, so my example was uh, economics versus environment. And it's actually not something that I, I feel super strongly about one way or the other, but it's, it's a good example, I feel. Um, so there were two things that I thought of, and I haven't thought of a, a solution for one of them. So I'll just uh, talk about the one where I, I did think of a solution here. Um, let's see. I figured that a creative approach using uh, investment, for instance, would be to to have um, just government or jobs at, at any level of government, but jobs that involve cleaning up the environment or uh, or working to prevent pollution, because that would actually uh, distribute wealth more so that uh, more people are empowered to, to spend, thus increasing the strength of the economy and also working to, uh, to preserve natural resources by cleaning up garbage, uh, things like that is a very simple example. Um, and so that would actually, it would essentially be taking the money that we're spending towards welfare and putting it towards we're going to, to pay people to actually do something useful by, by cleaning up the environment. So that, that seems like a fairly simple solution. Um, I have not yet figured out what happens when, um, when we try to prevent pollution that's caused by companies trying to make things as quickly as possible, as cheaply as possible, because reducing pollution from industry might make things more expensive. So I'm still working on how to how to change that into a positive approach to the economy. It might involve changing our philosophy of consumption, which would involve uh, trying to address decadence through the use of transcendence, stuff like that. But I'll I'll leave it at that because I haven't worked out the details of how that would go. More people are working on it already, though. That's the thing. And I pass to Maximus. Yeah, I I couldn't really think of anything of um, an alternative approach to this uh, situation. I was wondering if you guys had some input on that. Um, you know, um, yeah, you know, like we can have, of course, I mean, you know, like there's different... Uh, decisions being made at the local level and then there's this decisions being made at the at the at the state level and then there's decisions being made at this at the national level i mean yeah you can change i mean it's not all of a sudden going to be changed you know <laughs> that that is how we are used to making decisions but at the same time that is what we're running into that that is exactly the decision making structure you could say that is now uh revealed as yeah how do we how do we deal with this as you know i mean we're in my in one of my classes we talk a lot about the difference between collectivism and individualism and we are living in an individualistic society you know i mean everything is based on the right of the individual and um and and now are we all of a sudden are we all of a sudden becoming are we now all of a sudden going to become collectivistic? I don't think so, <laughs> you know. But um, of course, in terms of uh, dealing with this, there's got to be some sort of a yeah decision making process that will be the best for all of us, right? And uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> If you have any suggestions, I, I, I personally don't really know. I would use this framework, I think, to look at sort of what some small thing that you can do in your own community 
I think of the fact that like when masks were unavailable, my sister who's a professional, I, know, I guess Taylor is the easiest way to explain it. Um, you know, she didn't have any costumes to make for Disney and the Lyric Opera and the Met because they were all shut down and their own budgets were slashed. So she took fabric she already had and started making masks and making masks and making masks and putting them in a box outside her shop and saying, please just take one. People started leaving money so she could make more masks. And it was a service to the community that she could uniquely provide. And I think you kind of, in a, with something like COVID, you kind of have to look at stuff like that. I mean, I find that I, participate in like online communities, just trying to clarify misunderstanding. Like that's all, I, that's what I can do from my present position. I can look things up. I can find an article that answers somebody's question and, you know, post that in an online forum. I think that that's the kind of thing. And maybe I'm wrong, but I, I understood that as kind of the task. Like what, what, what things can you do? Maybe something like that. Does that help Maximus? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 I look also things up and I, <laughs> sometimes I talk about it with my wife and I, <laughs> even her and I have different opinions on these things. Uh, I don't know what I come up with or, and, and, and it's like, there's just so much, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, of course, as somebody that I, I come from the Netherlands, and I look also at how they're dealing with it in the Netherlands, and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's and and in, in in Germany and other European countries, and got like a oh, <laughs> they 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 haven't figured it out either, you know. Even though, of course, there is there is little differences certainly. But yeah, I, I hear you, um, something that helps, something that gives comfort and something that gives, um, I don't know, some kind of a reassurance that we're in this together, or that we are going, getting through this. I, I guess that's, that's, a, that's, that's as much as I can think of, but um, yeah, I don't know. Anne-Marie, did you have um, an approach to your own example? Yeah, I realized that, and I'm going to pro actually propose this at our next staff meeting on Tuesday, that with the information that goes out about which test students are asked to take, whether they're asked to take the, the native speakers test, or the SLAT, the speakers for, for speakers of other languages, um, that we could write a simple paragraph that explains, that gives an enthusiastic description of the way that ESL program views ourself and our responsibilities to international students. Um, and that paragraph could be very simple and just say, you know, we're so glad we were, you know, you're so lucky that the University of Wisconsin offers these programs to, and this support to matriculated students at the University of Wisconsin so that your student will get maximal success, Put it, throw in a few links uh, for interested parents or people who are feeling challenged on this um, that sh shares their research about better outcomes, including higher GPA and higher grad school acceptance rates for students who get an early intervention in their English language learning and, and English for academic purposes. Um, so those who don't care, they'll just click on the link and sign up for the SLAT. Those who read the paragraph and are convinced by the paragraph are fine. Those who are feeling like, wait a minute, they can go into those links on um, 
that give further information about why this is a long-term value for their kid and them. Because I, I, I think that that simple thing, it's, it's talking about investment, which is that we're investing in your kid. You know, the university is providing this expensive, frankly, and great resource for your kid because we value the success of our international students. Um, that, okay, I had the list in front of me while I was doing it. Uh, investment, pre preparation. I mean, obviously this, our whole program is about preparation. It's sort of explaining what the preparation is to avert the disaster of having your kid get to senior year and being asked to write a thesis and really like paying someone else to do it and getting caught for that. It happens more often at other schools that don't offer this kind of program. Um, but I think that the most important thing is that we're like addressing the ethics issue, which is like, yes, we understand your concerns about the fact that your kid's gonna have to do some extra work and this is how we've dealt with it. And we may or may not mention the fact that in the past ESL credits, they could only apply six credits toward graduation and only if they completed English 118. So people never skipped English 118 even if they didn't need it, because if they did, they wouldn't get the credits for, they'd already put in in 117 and 116 and 115. Now they can get up, they can get all the credits. If they take four semesters of English, they can get 12 credits of English toward their graduation if their particular program accepts that many electives in English. So they all, they, it, 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 we've done some things and we need to point out that we've done those things to make it a better deal for them and make it fairer for them. It seems pretty simple when you sit down and look at what could be done in this framework. So thank you for that, Alex. And on to Abby. Yeah, that's a um, kind of, I feel like I, was taking a similar approach as Mary to this to this problem and you know I I like the idea of being able to connect our research to kind of address you know addressing the core concerns and like you said Mary like if people don't understand the context in which these policies exist and kind of the history of how, you know, kind of the changes that have been made to respond to those, then it's difficult for people to understand. And so being able to present it in a format that's easily consumable, because just throwing an, a research article at somebody, you know, everybody's going to kind of come from a different perspective. So I like how you kind of stepped it out like, okay, we're going to provide this. And for some people, it's going to be good enough. For some people, it's, you know, not, and they're going to need access to this. So, um, so kind of my approach to you know, the, the drug policy issue and um, thinking about my own, my own personal transformation and beliefs about the issue kind of came from a deeper understanding of neurobiology and drug interactions within the brain and the body and kind of, and then the history of drug policy and kind of where some of those things came from. So my thought had to do with um, providing very clear and succinct information, date and, you know, research based kind of data um, that is easily consumable by the masses. So, you know, kind of traditionally the people who um, trust, you know, trust research less or, you know, scientific findings less than their own personal feelings. Um, you know, developing, I was just thinking about this, you know, creative idea about kind of investing and transcending some of those arguments by providing some, you know, very easily accessible educational materials on the brain science drug interactions and kind of the history of drug laws um and then you know kind of preparing 
preparing for you know to address the fear and the really you know the real concern that decriminalization might increase use um, by creating an infrastructure that you know that has more effective treatment options than what we have seen that than what we have right now um, and then from the ethics perspective um, and I was thinking about like getting people in contact with real life stories, more real, you know, real life stories of people and how they've been impacted by the drug, po by drug policies. Um, and, you know, not just kind of on an individual on like on a single case level, but on a, you know, more like continuing to impact their lives and, and how they, you know, how, they've kind of overcome that. Um, yeah, so investment in you know, education, simplifying things so people understand better the science, um, preparing by um, creating more infrastructure for more effective treatment, and then also kind of undoing and preventing further damage by um, teaching like sharing real life stories so people can um you know connect on a more heart level so that's my plan i'm awesome so I'll, see you, I'll see you next week okay thank you very much okay Hi. thanks for uh, thanks for attending maximus i'm great to see you thank you alex Bye, thank you Abby, and Mary. hi hi So thanks so much for, for your examples, everyone. And uh, I should also note, so these are great ideas for, for approaching these situations. But when you, when you launch them, it is possible that you may not address people's fears the first time. And so you'll need to, to present these ideas, maybe a prototype, and then uh, just ask them, does this address your concerns? And they may say no, because they are the authority on whether their fears are addressed. But this, this effort that we go to, to actually to accommodate the, the risks that they are willing or unwilling to take, that will build understanding and trust that will allow them to work with us to to contribute their ideas for what creative approaches, what extra outside efforts, just efforts outside the current situation might work to solve the problem for them while at the same time solving the problem for us. And so, so how's that, Mary? So, what are, I just want to add one more little thing. Well, actually, are we going to be able to continue talk after, talking after this, or just, do you guys have to yeah. go? I don't have to go. Abby? Um, I, yeah, I can hang around for, for just a little bit. But yeah, we can continue the conversation. OK, I just because I, 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 this isn't really part of the like, circle. It's more of a reflection on it. Mm -hmm. Is what I really love about what we did today is that these are things that I've kind of done in the past uh, as a result of being interviewed by a student maybe four or five years ago for a Chinese language uh, student radio station or something. This, the, the people who interviewed me, they'd all taken ESL. One of them was my former student. And they were like, wow, this is not a point of view about ESL that has ever been presented to us. We always felt like it was this onerous thing that's forced upon us and no one else. And yet you're telling us that our instructors all felt this way. And so I talked to, you know, by that time I was on the staff and I said, you know, we need to, we need to change this perception of ESL. If students are in 116, their teachers should be telling them Oh, you're so lucky to be at a school that supports you in this way. 
and a program that's got all these great teachers that really care about your long-term success. And so we have started adding that in, but this sort of framework gives me a more of a big picture. I just feel like it gives me a more complete way to see that like I'm not dismissing something that I think is silly. You know, like, the, oh, these parents and their obsession with like these three credits. Yeah, for them, that's important. How can I build that into the answer instead of just ignoring it? And I really, really like that. So I wanted to thank you for that. <laughs> mm, awesome. And this, I do find it, it does help. Next week, we're going to be talking about how to put this into practice to connect with people, to, uh, to show that we understand their concerns, and then to express our own concerns, and then to, to propose creative ideas using investment and preparation and transcendence and ethics in order to, to solve these problems by getting outside the immediate situation and bringing in everything else that we know, everything else that we can do. So that's what we'll be doing next week. And hopefully I will be, I, I thank you for, for helping me work through all these ideas and how best to present them because I think that they're going to uh, see a lot of use or at least a lot of need for use uh, in the next few months. Well, for the past few centuries, really, but this is the first time that, that I've had them, so. so. I, I have a question mm -hmm. for Abby about her mm -hmm. policy, because when you talk about real mm -hmm. life stories, mm -hmm. I feel like that can go both ways. And I feel like my own views about drug use have changed because of like an accretion of more stories. So, you know, mm. I, in, I was a kid in the 60s, I graduated. Cool. Up. Before we do that, is now a good time to close off the recording? Oh, maybe, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Abby, I think, what do you think? Yeah, I think, that would, I think that would be appropriate. We can carry, carry on this conversation. I'm, I'm good either way. Um, okay, Just, Yeah, no, okay. that's okay. I wasn't sure if, if it was, part of the meeting proper. I'm good either way too, um, because I, I do feel like it's part of the discussion that we were having. Yeah. Oh, okay. That you have to take in, like, so in the 60s, coming off of all of this, oh my God, drugs will fry your brain and don't ever touch them. And of course, everybody doing tons of them, you know, because I, you know, I went to a school, which, which I later found out was called the druggy school. There was the pregnant high school, the Christian high school, which was actually a public school, but apparently everybody who went there was like <laughs> holy rollers or something. I didn't know these things. And we were the druggy school. And I was like, well, that's odd. And then I was like, well, actually, maybe it's not, you know, because I never went to a party where you couldn't get anything you wanted, but I didn't touch it because that was kind of who I was. I just, I never experimented with drugs. I drank a little alcohol, didn't love it. So that was not, you know, that wasn't my high school experience. It certainly was the high school experience of my classmates, I'm going to say. Um, and there was all this sort of fear about all the terrible things that are going to happen to you. And yes, there were a couple of stories like that of people from my high school who like really blew out their brains, trying ev absolutely everything. And other people who uh, maybe didn't amount to very much because they couldn't stop smoking weed all the time. But so that was my early experience. But then when I like got involved with rationality and people were talking about their very careful experiments with life changing drugs and most especially when I had a student who by things that she has told me must have been part of some experimental LSD hallucinogenic drug trial that turned her from an absolutely silent person who couldn't make eye contact with people who were really trying to touch her and help her. And I knew them 
because she was an ESL student for quite a few semesters. I had her in her last semester when she just blossomed and she came in later in the, the you know, like after she finished my class, she came to see me twice just to talk. And she had not, been, we had not been able to get her to talk before. But her paper made it clear that some people were getting mental health relief from hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic drugs. And I was only vaguely aware of this because someone had written a paper the semester before. Um, so my views toward messing about with drugs changed over 40 years, 50 years. <laughs> um, different narratives and different, you know, oh, you know, so-and-so, he was such a promising musician, but he got addicted to drugs and now he lives on the street. That's also a story I'm familiar with. So um, I, I, what I'm trying to say is I think you have to be really careful what narratives you're looking at with which people. And yeah, I'm just like, so what's, what would be your, so your story? Yeah. So, so my perspective would be that all of those stories need to be shared because like, yes, that, you know, I would never say that drugs have never had a significant negative impact on people and their lives. Um, but being able to being able to share those stories and have things destigmatized because a lot of people a lot of times and you know I've experienced this in my own life like I've repressed the um I've repressed those stories and just like kept them hidden because of fear of what other people would think about that or kind of you know uh, you know if you knew like the drugs that I did when I was growing up you might think X, Y, and Z about me and my moral character and who I am. And, you know, being able to then just like break those chains and go like, it's just, you know, this is part of my human experience. It, you know, your human experience was different. You had this exposure, you made these choices. Let's dig in, like, let's dig into what the, you know, what were your core beliefs? Well, how were you raised? What were you taught? Like, you know, um, Alex, you in your comment about, you know, dare. And it's like, yes, for, for some kids, like that, you know, what you learned in dare was like, that is like, that is exactly the truth 100%. And that is going to govern, you know, that those rules are going to govern my actions. And sent some of us straight to drugs. Well, yeah. And then, so, you know, Dustin just shared it's like, and some, some people, it just sent them straight towards, towards drugs. It was like, oh, I want, you know, yep. let me yep. see what that's all about. Um, and so, you know, I think my perspective isn't just like, you know, you know, you people need to hear our stories. It's like, no, we need to hear each other's stories and really unpack like what, you know, what is driving these fears? What is driving these beliefs? Because we all have a story of a family member or a friend who was like, you know, they lost their job, they, you know, ruined their family, they, you know, commit, they, um, you know, died by suicide, they overdosed. I mean, it's just like, we all have those stories. And yes, those things kind of create, you know, kind of create our perspective and our perception, but it doesn't necessarily make it a, like, the truth and we shouldn't necessarily like be all you know our decision shouldn't be driven primarily by that fear because it's like yes it's a real fear and it's legitimate but it doesn't necessarily represent the totality of the story and what you often find out when you tell these stories that are stories about drugs and people's addictions is that there was way more going on than just the addiction. Like I think about the promising musician who suddenly had a drug problem and what, and then you learn that actually he was sort of struggling with his sexuality and whether he might be bi or gay. This was of course in the early seventies. What, you know, you're not even gonna talk about that. Um, and that, you know, actually he's schizophrenic. And so he's probably self-medicating around this pain and this psychic disturbance. 
these were not part of these stories when they were told the first time. Yeah, so I think, yeah, absolutely, sort of unpacking these actually very complicated stories of addiction. Um, unpacking the stories where a, an addicted person had tons of family support and in, unpacking other stories where that support was obviously really lacking, you know, or where there was a pain problem that was going undiagnosed or a mental health issue that was going undiagnosed. I have a very close friend whose daughter started doing heroin and she, bam, she got that kid into to, uh, a program just as fast as she could because the family has a history of mental illness. She quickly realized there's probably there was a psychotic break a couple years earlier, maybe a lot of psychic pain here. And that child, young woman, is, has been uh, drug free, you know, addictive drug free, not, you know, meds she has to be on free for about six years now. But different, different stories of family support, I think, are such a huge part of the addiction story. Um, so I like the idea of unpacking the stories, but maybe carefully and one at a time. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah, and the, uh, the, you're exactly right. It's like there's a, a time and a place and, um, you know, an audience. It's not, it's not easy to do those things and have those conversations. And so, um, but I think it's, you know, the willingness, being able to kind of cross that barrier and being willing to have those conversations and kind of, you know, throw your preconceived notions about what you, you know, what you know about drugs and addiction, you know, put those to the side and then being able to just come, you know, come to a place where we can share and just, you know, these are my life experiences. This is what I've learned. This is what I've seen. This is how, you know, this is how my perception and my perspective has been developed over time. And when we can have those conversations, like, you know, then it helps me see the perspectives of the other person. Like, oh, I totally get, I like, I totally 100% understand why you like why you are so adamant that this is not okay. Um, and, but it's not like, you know, we're not going to all get up on stage in front of 500 people and share our stories for the first time. That's a, you know, but it, it, it can be very powerful. Um, okay. no, I was just gonna, I was just gonna wrap up and, um, Oh, I would like to add something to that, though, because that that reminds me of another benefit that this vocabulary has is it allows us to describe why we think things are problems, because it everything reduces down to a fundamental liability. Why do people fear drugs? Because they fear decadence, the, the stagnation where people people's minds become locked something they fall into a pit why do people fear destruction of the environment because scarcity they feel like we're going to use it up and there's no earth left why do people fear like um, authoritarianism they fear the not only the locking of of thoughts the the dogma but also corruption they fear people will misuse it so all of these things it's we don't fear like uh, communism or capitalism just because it's the word we fear what's going to happen and what happens is these problems so it all just it all just reduces down to the basic concepts and then we can figure out why we can figure out what to do about them once we know why we fear them yeah for sure and i like i love this framework because of that it kind of takes it down to a very so to a very basic level, a common vocabulary that allows us to have more constructive conversations. Because what I feel like, you know, once we, when we have a common vocabulary, we can kind of, and we're speaking the same language, we don't have to have the same perspectives and the same beliefs, but we're, we're using that common, uh, that common understanding and framework. It helps us have more productive conversations because it takes the emotionality out of it. It's like a, you know, 
um, we're trying to, you know, understand fear like that, that is an emotion, but from a, like a cause and effect, like if this happens, this might happen and that might happen is very scary to me. And I don't want that thing to happen. Um, and so, you know, it's, you know, teaching us to kind of take away the emotionality, strip things down to their very basic level and have more kind of detailed conversations about what our fears are. And, and really, I think looking at like the probability, it's like, yes, that is a, that is a possibility and it is a probability. But if the probability is very low or the intensity or the impact is minimal, you know, that risk that risk is, you know, might be worth the reward in the long run. So with that, we will sign off for today and looking forward to next week when we um, uh, dig in even more into how, um, how these concepts can apply and help us in um, framing our conversation so we can um, work together more collaboratively and more effectively to solve those, all our shared problems as humans. So thank you all, and I look forward to seeing you next week.